Thanks, Janet. It's uh, my great pleasure to chair this morning's session, um, recognizing this year's Gairdner awardees. Um, as Janet just said, the, the lectures that we're going to hear in the next uh, 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 couple of hours really exemplify, I think, the goals of the Gairdner Foundation uh, to recognize uh, exemplary research um, that uh, is, runs from the foundational to the applied uh, biomedical research. And in fact, the amazing uh, talks we'll hear today uh, range from the invention and applications of transformative technologies for looking at proteins and molecules and how they work, the development of vaccines, um, to the invention of drugs that are used to treat uh, coronary artery disease uh, around the world. And this may seem like quite a diverse uh, range of topics, but in fact, there's a common thread running through all of these, and that's they're founded in basic fundamental research discoveries, and they are really grounded in technological innovation and really forward-looking thinking. And so with that introduction, I'll introduce our first speaker for this morning, uh, Dr. Lewis Kay. And he's been recognized um, for his, the development of modern NMR spectroscopy for studies of biomolecular structure dynamics and function, including applications to molecular machines and rare protein conformations. I've had the pleasure of knowing Lewis uh, for many years. We started our labs here at the University of Toronto around the same time. He's currently a university professor in the departments of molecular genetics, biochemistry, and chemistry, and senior scientist um, at the Hospital for Sick Children. Um, Lewis joined the University of Toronto after completing some studies at the NIH and Yale University, uh, became assistant professor here in uh, 1992, and Lewis is one of the very few, maybe the only, I'm not sure, person that got promoted directly from assistant professor to full professor at the University of Toronto uh, two years after he was recruited as assistant professor, which is really quite astounding. Um, uh, as you'll hear, he's been interested in the development of a nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR techniques to study proteins, the fundamental biomolecules bio in, in human and other cells. And he's made several uh, important contributions that really turned NMR into a technique that's used around the world to study the fundamentals of cell biology and protein structure and function. Um, Lewis uh, has already received uh, many accolades in a war. He's, he's listed by the ISI as a highly cited author in chemistry in the top 0.5% worldwide. And he was named one of the top 25 most cited physical scientists in the world between 90, 1990 and 1997. Um, also, it's astounding uh, the number of people that have gone through Lewis's lab and gone on to also run their own remarkable labs around the world with more than 30 people that are now on faculty at different universities. So with that, I'll introduce uh, Lewis, whose talk today will be, what's up there? Wrestling with Heisenberg to capture the beautiful dance of protein molecules in health and disease. Lewis. Well, thank you very much, Brenda, for that nice introduction, and thank you, Gardner, for giving me the uh, distinct pleasure of being able to speak here today. What I would like to do today is briefly describe one particular snippet of our research, focusing on some of the methodologies that we've developed, and then the application of these methodologies to a couple of uh, problems of interest to uh, biophysics. And I want to begin by considering a simple one-dimensional energy landscape. This is highly fictional because proteins are very complicated. This is an energy landscape of a protein. Along the y-axis is going to be the free energy, and along the x-axis is going to be some other coordinate like protein structure. And the majority of copies of a given protein are going to be domiciled right at the uh, base here, corresponding to the lowest free energy, much like if one had a funnel and one took a bunch of marbles, the marbles would go to the bottom of the funnel. But our funnel here is going to be a rugged landscape, and so not all of the marbles are going to get to the base. There's going to be some conformers of the protein, for example, that are going to be in uh, local minima here. And these conformers may be quite distinct from that uh, uh, conformation in the ground state. It may be also that the conformers in the conformationally excited states, so-called because they're of higher energy than the ground state, it may be that it's these conformers that are important for biological function and misfunction. So if we want to understand protein structure, dynamics, and function in detail, we have to focus not only on the lowest energy positions in the landscape where we have the technologies to do so, but also on higher energy uh, conformations as well. So there has to be a shift in paradigm, uh, at least so I thought about 20 years ago, and we've been working towards that goal. Now, the, one of the fundamental problems is that these uh, higher energy conformational states 
uh, are often invisible to the technologies that we have. For example, if one looks at low-line states that are higher in energy by, say, only a couple of kcals per mole. So to orient you, a couple of kcals per mole would be a hydrogen bomb. So that's not very much energy whatsoever, but if one does a back-of-the-envelope calculation, those conformers are going to be populated at roughly a percent relative to the ground state. And so that makes them very difficult to be detected by physically because they're so sparsely populated. In fact, there's another problem that is much more severe. If we imagine that we have an exchange between a ground state uh, conformation, say state A, and an excited conformation state B that are in equilibrium one with the other, what that means is that the flux of the molecules from state A to state B is equal to the flux of molecules from state B to state A, and that causes problems. For example, suppose that we had a bag of marbles, state A marbles, and we had a million marbles in state A. That's the ground state. And then we have state B, which is an excited state. There's a lot fewer molecules, so a lot fewer marbles in the bag, say only 1,000. If the same number of marbles are going to fly from bag A to bag B, that means that the lifetime of marbles in bag B is going to be a lot smaller. And so we encounter a fundamental physical problem, and that's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Because the lifetime of the state B marbles, or state B conformational states, is so short, we have difficulty making our measurements. We have difficulty determining the frequencies of all of the nuclei in the excited state. And since we have difficulty doing that determination, essentially what happens is the signals just melt away into the baseline, and the uh, signals that we would normally observe become completely invisible. So if we look at a particular NMR probe, say a nucleus, say a carbon or a nitrogen or a proton, and we literally have hundreds of these in the context of a protein molecule, but what I'm showing you here is a given carbon, say, the signal that we derive from that. In state A, we get a nice signal, but the corresponding carbon in state B essentially gives a, such a broad signal that is so low in intensity that we can't observe it, even if we were to, going to record a spectrum for a year or two. And so that's problematic, and the question is, how do we go about studying that which is invisible? Well, supposing that you're an enzymologist and you're looking at a reaction, and you cool down the enzyme that can exist between two states, say a red state and a blue state, you cool it down so that the interconversion between the two states is very small. And what I show here is a situation where we have an equilibrium constant of, say, one. So we have an equal number of the two different conformations of the enzyme. And we would have many NMR observables. Uh, we would have many peaks that can provide us with information on the two different conformational states of the enzyme. For simplicity, I just uh, have shown you uh, a red peak for the red conformation, a blue peak for the blue conformation. Now, typically, of course, we would have skewed population, so we may only have a half a percent of the red peaks, and therefore we can't observe them, and yet we want to get out the detailed structure of this invisible state. Well, rather than talk about NMR and spins and quantum mechanics, I'd rather just focus on a simple uh, version of that, and that's to think about these peaks as derived from stick boys. And so you can have blue stick boys that are walkers, and you can have red stick boys that are runners. And again, for the purposes of this analogy, there's no interconversion between the stick boys. Runners are always runners, and walkers are always walkers. And what we're going to do is an experiment whereby we start the stick boys at time equals zero on the start line and then allow them to evolve for a time tau. Well, the runners are going to run and the walkers are going to walk, so the runners are going to get ahead of the walkers, but then we're going to stop them precisely after a time tau and turn them around. In an NMR, that's very easily done. We simply apply a, apply a pulse called a 180-degree pulse. And then we allow the system to evolve for a second time tau. Now, the runners are still going to run. The walkers are going to walk. And so after the second time tau, they're all going to converge on the start line or the finish line at the same time to produce what is called a Hunspin echo after the famous physicist who first characterized this phenomenon. Now, let's complicate things a little bit. Let's assume that there's interconversion between our two conformations, stochastic interconversion. So we have our stick boys, we have runners and walkers, we have skewed populations, maybe we can't see the runners because they're only present at a half a percent, and the runners aren't in terribly good shape, so they're going to start to walk a little bit later on. The walkers are going to get embarrassed and start to run, and this is going to happen in a stochastic manner. So uh, individual runners and walkers are going to jump back and forth. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to have a fixed period in time during which we allow the runners and walkers to evolve. And during that time, we're going to apply a series of these pulses, a variable number of these pulses. Remember, these pulses are going to stop the runners and walkers in their track and turn them around. Now, if we apply pulses, many of them, at a rate which is fast compared to the differences in the speeds between the runners and walkers, then they're never going to get out of sync with one another. And so even if there's an interconversion, a stochastic interconversion between a runner and a walker, we won't be able to detect it because they're always moving essentially at the same average speed. So if we plot the distribution of stick boys that cross the finish line at the end of the race, it will be a very narrow distribution indeed. By contrast, if we only apply a single pulse during the same interval of fixed duration, then when we have a, a stochastic interchange between a runner and a walker, that will have a big effect. And therefore, if we plot the distribution of stick boys that cross the finish line, we'll get a very broad distribution. And so what we're going to do is we're going to carry out the stick boy experiment, plotting the fatness of our NMR lines, if you like, as a function of the number of pulses that we apply to learn details about the conformational exchange reaction that we're studying. We'll learn the relative populations of the runners and walkers, the rates of interconversion, and most importantly, we'll learn about the speeds of the runners and walkers, because it turns out that in NMR, those speeds give us information about structure. Here are a number of uh, people who have contributed to the stick boy experiment in my laboratory. And what we end up with at the end of the day is we plot fatness of the NMR line along the y-axis as a function of the number of pulses we apply along the x-axis. And if we get a flat response, then we know that there's no interconversion between the runners and walkers. By contrast, if we get a response that looks like this or like this, that gives us the detailed information about the kinetics, thermodynamics of the process, and also about the structure of the invisible state, which is interconverting uh, with the ground state of our protein molecule. There's another approach that we can take, which I call a hammer approach, which was uh, developed by Promote in the lab and supervised uh, really by uh, Alex uh, in, in the lab. And uh, that's a similar approach in that it involves also studies of conformational exchange. So we have a ground state and we have an invisible excited state. And let's suppose that we focus on just a single C13 spin, on just a single probe of structure and dynamics in this particular protein. Of course, we would have many hundreds of probes uh, in reality. Well, if we record an NMR spectrum, it might look like this. Here's the peak that is associated with that carbon in the ground state. And here would be the corresponding peak in red associated with the carbon in the conformationally excited state. Now, I've drawn this peak here so that you can see it, but remember that peak would be invisible. We're not going to be able to see it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take out our little magical NMR hammer that costs several millions of dollars, and we're simply going to tap at different positions in the spectrum. So if we tap far away from the position of any of the peaks, nothing happens. But as we move our magical hammer to the position of the invisible state, remember it's invisible, we don't know where we're at in terms of the position of this red peak, but when we get to that position and we tap, much in the same way that you would tap a nail into a wall, well, this little peak here is going to uh, be reduced. And by virtue of the fact that it's exchanging between an excited state and a ground state, we can observe the effect on the ground state, and of course we can see the ground state peaks because those are highly visible and they're associated with conformations that are very populated. So we get an amplification of the signal despite the fact that the signal derives from an invisible state by virtue of the fact that we tap on this state, the information is transferred to the blue peak and we observe the blue peak. As we go through the spectrum, when we take our magical hammer and tap on the blue peak, of course, we have a big effect. We decrease that peak. So if we plot the intensity of the observed blue peak as a function of the position of the hammer, we're going to get a small dip corresponding to the position of the invisible state for that particular C13, and therefore identify the frequency and we're going to get a big dip that's associated with the frequency of the carbon that's attached to the ground state. And so in this way, we can see the invisible using the hammer experiment. So we now have a couple of experiments. We have stick boy and hammer, 
and we want to apply these experiments to uh, understand uh, dynamics in biophysical systems. And the first example that I'd like to uh, describe to you is an example involving an SH3 domain, a very nice collaboration with my colleague, uh, Alan Davidson, and this work was carried out by Philip when he was a postdoc in the lab. And we were interested in understanding the folding process of SH3 domains, and we quickly realized that the folding process proceeds through the formation of an invisible intermediate. That's important both for folding and, as it turns out, also for misfolding. And so what we want to do is we want to get an atomic resolution map of this invisible state using the various technologies that uh, over the years have been developed. And so we applied the stick boy experiment. You can see that we have a large number of really wonderful curves that we can interpret to get out structural information. And then we can take that structural information uh, and add it to molecular dynamics programs. This is a collaboration with Michele Vandrescolo, who is located in Cambridge University. And this allowed us to determine the structure of the invisible state. So we can't see it directly by NMR, but Stick Boy helps us out. We also determined the structure of the ground state, the folded form of the protein molecule. And the structure of the ground state is shown here in gold. And the structure of the invisible intermediate state on the pathway of folding and misfolding, as it turns out, is shown in green. We've superimposed the two structures, and you can see that they're very similar with the exception of one strand, and that's beta-5, which is present in the ground state in the folded form of the protein, but is absent in the intermediate state. It hasn't yet folded. So that's the final folding step, and it hasn't occurred in this folding intermediate. Now that gives rise to a number of rearrangements to the structure of the intermediate uh, with respect to uh, the ground state. For example, by virtue of the fact that beta-1 can no longer interact with beta-5 in an intermediate because it's not present, beta-1 snuggles up more closely to beta-2 and forms non-native interactions. And furthermore, there's a phenylalanine residue in the core of the uh, protein, which is now going to shift position from the native ground state to occupy the space which normally would have been occupied by beta-5. But the real important thing is that beta-5 no longer forms in the excited state, and that exposes beta-1. So beta-1 is now exposed in the intermediate state. So what is the effect of exposing beta-1? Well, one can carry out an analysis using uh, computational software, again, something that Michele van der Scolo wrote, which essentially measures the aggregation tensity uh, tendency on a per residue basis, taking into account the amino acids and also the structural features of the protein in question. So what I look at now is the folded, the ground state, the native state of the protein molecule, color-coded according to the tendency to aggregate. And the color scheme is indicated here. Red indicates hot or a tendency to aggregate, and green essentially means uh, no tendency uh, for aggregation. And you can see that in the native state, beta-5 protects beta-1. And beta-1, which normally would have a high tendency to aggregate, now cannot by virtue of the fact that beta-1 is interacting with it and protecting it. By contrast, if we look at the structure of the invisible intermediate state and color code it in the same manner, you can now see that beta-1, which no longer is protected by beta-5, in fact, beta-5 is unfolded and indicated here, beta-1 now is color-coded in such a way that indicates its aggregation propensity. You can see that it's uh, bright orange, so it tends to aggregate. And indeed, if we were to chop off beta-5, we would form fibers as indicated here. So we have a folding mechanism by which the unfolded state proceeds through an intermediate, that intermediate then goes to the ground state, but the intermediate can misfold to form a conformationally excited state, uh, which is going to be aggregation prone. Now, we don't get too much aggregate formed, and the reason for that is because the population of this excited state is very low. Its lifetime is also going to be uh, very small, and that protects the protein, allowing the reaction to proceed to form the ground state. Now, once you're in the ground state, you're not safe, of course, because the system is one that is in equilibrium. And so we have an exchange between the ground state conformations and the conformationally excited uh, state conformations. And so there's always a possibility for aggregation. 
but the general pathway is towards the ground state. Let me describe another such experiment, and this experiment, another uh, system, and this system is superoxide uh, dismutase. Superoxide dismutase is in its native form a very stable protein. You can literally boil the protein and uh, the conformation is retained in the uh, stabilized form, which is the growing up form, the mature form of the protein, if you like. The protein is going to be stabilized by virtue of the fact that it forms a dimer, by virtue of the fact that it binds metal ions, one copper and one zinc per protomer, and by virtue of the fact that it also forms an intra-protomer disulfide bond. So we have a very stable structure, and yet despite the stability of the structure, it's been implicated in ALS, mutations in superoxide dismutase, can cause familial ALS. They can lead to aggregation of superoxide dismutase despite its apparent significant stability. Aggregates are found in motor neurons of patients. And misfolded conformers of superoxide dismutase have been hypothesized to be the toxic species, at least in some occurrence of ALS. And so we thought we would try to understand the dynamics of this particular molecule and look at the energy landscape beyond looking simply at the ground state where we have all of these wonderful technologies, but going a little bit higher in energy and seeing what we can see. And so we're going to focus on a baby form of superoxide dismutase. This is a native reduced form, so we haven't formed the stabilized disulfide uh, interaction. It's an APO form of the protein, so no metal ions. Uh, and we're going to bring to bear the various NMR experiments that are available to study that. Now, one NMR experiment that one can do really can measure the overall dynamics of the backbone. And that's shown here. So we plot along the y-axis something called an order parameter. That's the amplitude of motion at each position. So when there's more motion, these order parameters are going to be lower. When there's uh, less motion, the order parameters are going to be higher. So an order parameter of 1 indicates that you have a rigid structure, and an order parameter of 0.2 or 0.3 indicates that you have a highly dynamic structure. And we can quantify that at each amino acid position in the protein. Well, when we do these experiments for the mature form, the dimeric stabilized structure of the enzyme, we get this red curve here with order parameters of around 1, so a very stable highly rigid structure. By contrast, if we look at the baby form of the molecule before the post-translational modifications, we get order parameters shown in green, so much lower order parameters indicating that prior to post-translational modifications, we have a very dynamic molecule. And so what we thought we would do is we would study these conformational fluctuations from the ground state in the baby form. These are thermally activated conformational fluctuations, meaning that they occur at room temperature, and they most certainly would occur in cells in our body. Now, I should say that the nat nascent form of the uh, molecule is going to be structurally very similar to the protomers in the mature state. And so what we've done is we've carried a few experiments. In particular, let's focus on the hammer experiment initially. And I want to focus on one particular uh, process initially. There are several that I'll describe. A process which we characterize via glycine 61 and the residues that are around it. Now remember this hammer experiment is going to produce two dips for each residue in the protein. A major dip at the uh, chemical shift of the ground state, but more importantly, this minor dip that gives us the chemical shifts of the invisible state. And we carried out the hammer experiment as a function of two different concentrations, 0.7 millimolar and 1.3 millimolar. And you can see that there's a concentration dependence in the minor state dip. So we know automatically that the baby protein is going to be forming some sort of aggregate as an excited state. And we want to determine what the structure of that aggregate is. And we have a lot of chemical shifts. We have nitrogen chemical shifts and we have carbon chemical shifts. Chemical shifts at NMR are exquisite reporters of structure, and so we're going to exploit that. 
And what we did is we simply compared these chemical shifts of the blue baby, shown here along the y-axis, both for nitrogen and carbon, versus the chemical shifts of the mature form of the enzyme, the dimeric, fully processed form of the enzyme. And you can see that there's very nice correlations. When you get correlations like that, you know that the structures must be the same. And so the baby form of the protein is trying to grow up like its mature parent to form a native functional protein. We looked at another process as well. This process was again studied by the Hammer experiment. And here, if we superimpose the uh, profiles that we obtained, this for threonine 135, a characteristic uh, residue of this process, and we look at the profiles as a function of differences in concentration of protein, we can see now that the minor dips are concentration independent. So we know we have a unimolecular process. Again, we can measure chemical shifts for that process and we can plot these chemical shifts versus the chemical shifts that we get for the fully mature form of the enzyme. You can see that there's a very beautiful correlation again, and that tells us that whatever is happening structurally for the baby protein is already present in the mature protein, and that's a conformational transition from a unfolded segment to a helical form. In fact, it's this helix here that is formed in an electrostatic loop of the dimeric structure. And we have, therefore, a second process where the baby is trying to grow up to become a mature functional protein. But alas, things are not so simple. We were able to uh, establish, and this is work of Ashok, a very talented former postdoc in the laboratory, we were able to establish that there's a couple of other processes, and these processes give rise to aberrant structures. These aberrant structures can be modeled to form fibers, and these fibers are clearly aberrant and may be important uh, in the development of disease. Now, this emphasizes the importance of excursions from the ground state of the protein. We uh, start with the ground state of the protein, excursions to various conformationally excited states. And these conformations can occur at room temperature. Now, I want to emphasize the importance of these conformationally excited states. They're sparsely populated, and they're going to be transiently formed, but nevertheless, they can be very important. If we look at the baby protein again, focusing on the wild type, and now focusing on various disease mutations, and we compare the structures of the ground states, the populated states of the baby protein and of the disease mutants, and we can do that very easily by NMR by measuring so-called chemical shifts, which are exquisite reporters of structure, I summarize some data here. So what I plot here along the y-axis is chemical shift as a function of residue position for a variety of different disease mutations compared to the wild type. There's a few blips that you can see, a few differences, but those differences are associated specifically at the mutation site or in the vicinity of the mutation site. But the differences are on average very small, indicating that the structures of the ground states are all the same. So if we were just to focus using traditional biophysical approaches on the ground states, we really wouldn't get much insight into uh, what these disease mutants are doing. And yet we can use stick boy and hammer uh, to try to understand things. For example, if we look at process one, remember that's the process whereby the uh, nascent polypeptide chain grows up to become a stabilized dimer. And we can study that process via this dip here, you can see that for various disease mutations, the dip simply disappears. So we don't have that excited state in the energy landscape. Conversely, if we look at process number two, again, that was the formation of this nascent helix. As a function of disease mutant, it disappears. So that excited state is no longer going to be populated. There are other excited states that are not populated for the wild type that become populated as a function of various disease mutants, and that's shown here using the stick boy experiment. So what I show here in these blue curves, which are flat curves, are results for the wild type protein, indicating that we don't have a process involving these particular residues. By contrast, though, if we look at a single disease mutant, say G85R or G93A, we see that these flat curves in the wild type all of a sudden are not flat in the context of the disease mutant, indicating that we have additional states that are of higher energy on the uh, landscape. So there are significant differences not in the ground state, but in the conformationally excited states, in the invisible states. Well, I think we're now at a point, this concludes really my introductory remarks,
And we're now at a point that we can begin to understand really what is the take home message that I want to convey uh, in my talk. And I think this is going to be a message that will be of more than passing interest to a number of the principal invest investigators who are in attendance. And I'd like to convey this message by means of a question. Sometimes I find when I lecture, conveying an idea by asking a question is the best way. This is an important question, so stay tuned. The question is, how does one go about winning a Gairdner Award? And let me illustrate that. This is how I did it. What I show here is a list of some of the 60 odd trainees that I've had in my laboratory that have entered my laboratory throughout the last two and a half decades and whose intelligence and dedication and perseverance and stamina and collective brilliance really results in my being here today serving as a spokesperson for all of their work. I owe them, of course, a huge debt of gratitude and, of course, also one to my many collaborators. And I think my gratitude to my trainees can only be uh, expressed by somebody who was far more eloquent than I. And so I turn to Rabbi Hanina, one of the uh, greatest Talmudic sages, when he says, I have learned much from my teachers. I have learned more from my colleagues than from my teachers. But I have learned more from my students than all of them. So to my students who have taught me far more than I have them, I say thank you. To the Gardner Foundation, I say thank you, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.